Hello, my name is Athenia Rodney, CEO and founder of Juneteenth NYC. This is a special invitation for you to attend with Juneteenth NY. We're thrilled to announce that this year's celebration promises to be bigger and better than ever before. Join us for an unforgettable experience filled with a wide array of exciting performances, delightful vendors, mouth-watering food trucks and vendors, an exclusive fashion show, a rally at Barclays Steps, a free bus ride with health drink tastings. Don't miss that. For those of you with little ones, don't worry. We've got you covered also. Juneteenth NY 2023 is the event for all ages. We'll be featuring a dedicated kid zone so that your young ones can join in on the fun. So why wait? Grab your free tickets. Yes, free. It doesn't cost anything, but we do need you to register so that we can prepare for the amount of people that will be in attendance on the weekend. So we look forward to you, for you to go to our website at www.juneteenthny.com or you can go to our Instagram at JuneteenthNY, like us, follow us, engage with our page. We'd love to see you participating. It warms my heart. Trust me, it does. And then go to our link tree and you'll get a direct link to register. Um, this will be a monumental occasion. We can't wait to see you there. Thank you and have a good one. Up next, community, we are going to go and take a deeper dive. This is a very, 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 very sensitive topic. And I just want to kind of put a little bit of a, a, a warning out there that this may uh, trigger some people out there. We are going to be speaking with Dr. Donna Barnes, who will be here to give us a presentation um, on suicide. She is the CEO and founder of DHB Wellness and Associates, where she conducts life coaching, grief recovery, and suicide prevention training on suicide risk management. I'm sure as, if, if, as, as I have become aware of and pay attention to the news, the rates of suicide in our community are up a whole lot more than when I was, um, I'll just say this much, my son is 22 and he has experienced the loss of three friends at this young tender age that have given in to um, the pressures of life. And at, at 46, I can't say that I have one close friend that has. So this is just something that definitely affects our youth that is affecting our community at a very high rate. And it's something that we all need to be aware of and to, um, to learn as much as we can about so that we can support our loved ones and be there when they need us. So let's uh, hear what Dr. Barnes has to say. She is of NAPCAS, the National Organization for People of Color Against Suicide. Hi, my name is Dr. Donna Holland Barnes, co-founder of the National Organization for People of Color Against Suicide, better known as NAPCAS. NAPCAS was founded in 1998 by three parents who lost sons to suicide in the early 1990s. Myself, Dara Smith out of Atlanta and Les Franklin out of Denver. We saw a need to educate communities of color on suicide in the black communities and to help families who have lost loved ones to suicide get through the grieving process. NAPCAS was the first black organization where suicide prevention was its primary focus. Since 1998, we have held national conferences and communities of color for 10 straight years. Our last conference was in 2010. Now we provide training and resources for those communities looking to be trained and recognize the signs when someone's in a suicidal crisis. During those active years, we learned that our communities present suicide behavior differently than the dominant culture. When we become suicidal, many times we purposely live a dangerous life because life no longer has any meaning. Then there are times when we become very vulnerable, impulsive, fearless, and when a desired and with a desired method, we take our own life. It is interesting to note that 
back then in the late 90s, or ah, the early 90s. It is interesting to note that in the early 90s, when we lost our sons to suicide, there was nobody in our communities talking about it. Absolutely no one. So it was, it was hard to heal in a community when no one's talking about it. It's a taboo topic. So when we founded NOPCIS and started going to black communities, talking about suicide prevention and intervention in the communities and having workshops and having speakers talk about the causes, uh, the effects, and what we can do about it, what we can do to stop it, what we can do to decrease it, what we can do for survivors of suicide. At first, when we started, people didn't want us coming to their community talking about a taboo subject. What are you doing here? We don't want you. But eventually, people started realizing that there was a need. I can remember a time when we had a conference in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it was put in the paper that Noctis was coming to town. And a maintenance person in a local school read it. And when he read it, he went to the principal and said, I need to go to this conference. I really do need to go to this conference. Because he was a Black man working in a Black school and he would hear stories. Kids would talk to the maintenance guy. He was friendly, he was, he was reachable, he would listen to them. And he literally got the school to pay for his registration to come to our conference. When he told his story, we were amazed. We were amazed. Even though people at first didn't accept us coming to the community doing the training, we kept doing it anyway so that they would realize that, look, this is something that happens in our community and we have to stop hiding it. We have to stop camouflaging the, the cause of death, cause, cause, calling it an accident, calling it cleaning their gun, an overdose, whatever. We needed to have people recognize the signs because the only way we could prevent suicide in our neighborhoods is to talk about it. Presently, the rate of suicide has increased among young black males under the age of 12, as well as those between ages 15 and 25. We're in a crisis and we need to continue talking about it and doing something about it. Not is still just training, you can come to your community and do all the training that you need. And we have resources on our site. We support other people, other organizations who want to do something about suicide prevention. The important thing that we need to understand is that any organization that we have in our community working with youth, working with people of color, should have suicide prevention somewhere in the mix. Do something about suicide prevention. Talk about it, hold, hold whatever you need to hold, a seminar, what have you, in reference to suicide prevention. We should talk about it in our churches. We should talk about it in the schools. The schools are starting to do some kind of training for faculty and staff to recognize the signs when the students are in suicidal crisis, but not enough and not wide enough. Talk about it in schools, faith-based institutions, any community-based organization, whatever you have in your community working with kids, talk about it. Now, generally, what I do with young kids, elementary age, elementary school age, I don't talk about suicide, suicide, suicide. I generally talk about coping skills because that's the thing that they're missing when they're thinking of suicide. They're missing the coping skills. What happens is their coping mechanisms break down. 
Most of the time, our coping mechanisms are intact. But for not just kids, anyone who's thinking about suicide and actually attempts or complete suicide, it's because their coping mechanisms have broken down. It's because life at that moment has no more meaning. It's because they're trying to move here and there and go forward and something is getting in their way. They see no way out to continue their journey. We have to help them get through those roadblocks. We have to help the suicidal person understand that you'll get through this. You, you'll make it. I am going to take a few minutes because the suicide rates are increasing among black males under the age of 12. I'm going to take a few minutes to, to go over talking with your children. We're good parents. We try to do what's right. But sometimes kids still feel that we don't understand. When I talk to youth or uh, when other people are telling me what their youth are saying in these schools, most of the time they're saying that my parents just don't understand. And that's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. Okay, so in talking with your children, many times it's very hard to figure out whether they're being typical or are they troubled. Sometimes we need to really be able to hone on, hone in on the difference. Because if we know the difference between whether they're typical or trouble, we can make a difference. As mentioned, the suicide rate among black youth have been found to be increasing faster than any other racial ethnic group. So we do have we can have children in our family who are constantly acting up, constantly uh, getting into trouble. And what we need to know, it, you know, when, when they take their own life at a very early age, such as 12 and under, we're wondering how could we have picked up the signs? We're wondering, oh, where did we go wrong? Well, let's look at the acronym FIDI, F-I-D-I, -I. F for frequency. How often does the outburst of their behavior occur daily, weekly, monthly? I for intensity. How forceful are the outbursts? And do they cause trauma for others around them or cause negative reactions by others? D is for duration. How long does it last? Is it all night, all morning, all day, or maybe just a few minutes? I for impairment. How much does it get in the way of you being able to do the things as a family? Impairment is a telltale sign, especially if it gets in the way of family relationships and causing conflict between family, family members. So it's Fidi, F. I D I frequency, intensity, duration, and impairment. And again, impairment is a telltale sign, especially if it gets in the way of family relationships and cause conflict between family members. Possible causes. And the causes aren't so important as the fact that that's what they're presenting at the time. But I'll talk to you just a little about the causes. It could be biological, it could be genetics, it could be strong reactions to interruptions. Sometimes kids are very sensitive and vulnerable and they have very strong reactions to their daily rhythm. Kids like consistency. When they come into the house, they expect everything to be the same. They love consistency. So if their daily rhythm is interrupted, such as hunger or lack of sleep, irritability, they may react. They may react. 
sometimes they have the inability to control their emotions. They're very sensitive sometimes, very temperamental, especially if we are giving harsh discipline. They react to harsh discipline. They react to harsh discipline and threats more than anything. And if you have harsh disciplines and threats, their behavior gets even worse. So sometimes you want to tone that down. They're acting out for a reason. Kids don't necessarily want to be out of line. They're acting out for a reason. So that's when it's time to sit them down and say, okay, let's have a talk. As parents, we often find that it is necessary to adjust our parenting skills. What we are looking for in our children is to behave so that behavior is not disruptive, it's productive, and it's obedient. That's what we're looking for. So sometimes they step outside those lines. When you decide to sit down and talk to this child, let them know that you care. Ask them what they feel they want or need from you in the conversation. Remember that you are talking with them and not to them. And don't judge. They already know that they're acting up. So please don't make them feel any worse by judging them or comparing them to another brother or sister or a neighbor. Don't judge, don't compare. Express an interest in what they say without being pushy or intrusive. Don't drop down to them and don't lecture. Talk to them as an equal. Kids are smart. They're much smarter than you think they are. Let them complete their sentences or finish sharing their point of view before you respond. Remember what it was like when you were a child. You also need to be genuine and honest. Be genuine and honest with your kids. Sometimes when things happen to a child that's very traumatic to them, we don't know how traumatic it is because they can't tell us. They don't have the words to express how this is making them feel. Like losing a pet. Sometimes we need to be able to let them talk about the loss without trivializing it. I let them talk about any kind of traumatic thing that's happening to them in school without trivializing it. Because they don't know how to process hurt feelings, trauma, because they never learned. We learned everything else when we were growing up. How to get through school, how to have a good relationship, get married, have children, have a job. We learned all of these things, but we never learned how to deal with trauma. And it starts when they notice something's going on with you. They'll look up and say, what's wrong, mom? Or what's wrong, dad? And you say, oh, everything is fine. We're doing good. Just go, go play. We're doing fine. They can see it in your face that everything is not fine. So they learn at a very early age to hide it. Because that's what you guys are doing to them. You're hiding your feelings. And they think that whenever something's wrong, you're not supposed to express it. So they don't learn. They don't learn language and they don't learn how to do that. So we need to let them know that we're here for you. Talk about it without trivializing it. That's the last thing you want to do. What's major to them may be minor to you, but that's not important. The important thing is that it's major to them. The most important thing, like I said, is your willingness to listen. Don't rush through the conversation. Don't interrupt. Don't feel that your point of view needs to be heard because you're there to listen to them. If they keep repeating themselves, that's fine. That's fine. You don't want to make them feel that you're really not paying attention. All you're thinking about is getting dinner ready. 
use paraphrasing when you're trying to repeat what you heard, such as, let me make sure I understand this. You said that, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. And that tells them you're really listening because you're feeding it back to them. If they ask you a tough question and you don't know, let them know you don't know, but that together you'll work on finding an answer. Listen to their point of view, even if it's difficult to hear, because as parents, we're constantly on the defensive. We hear our child telling us something, and you say, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't remember that like that. I don't remember saying that. Uh, no, that's not how I felt. What I was trying to do was don't argue with them. If that's how they saw whatever they're talking about, that's how they saw it. There's really no truth. All perspective, because your kids can have a different perspective of something that happened two years ago than you. You got your perspective, which is your truth. They got their perspective, which is their truth. Don't argue about who's right or wrong. It's all perspective. Hear theirs. And don't feel it necessary at that particular time to tell them what your perspective is. Just hear them. And if you can just listen to them, get their point of view, even if it's difficult, if you can do that, you'll be amazed at how much you have opened up the the communication gap. You'll be surprised how you have started. You'll be surprised at how much the lines of communication are open. You want to acknowledge their opinions and their feelings while also working with them to commit to safety and life. Resist getting into an argument, like I mentioned, and emphasize the fact that there are resources available for them if they need to get help outside. And you want to remain impartial as much as possible. You want to remind them that their own of their own personal worth. And you want to let them know that you sincerely believe that they can make it through whatever they are going through because you're there for them. You're there to protect. You're there to help them get through what they're going through. And it's really important that we understand that. So talking and communicating to your kids will go a long, long way because they feel isolated. They feel that nobody understands. And let it start it. Let it start it. Sometimes it's hard as parents. But you can do this. I know you can. So finally, the other thing I wanted to go through is the importance of making sure that you have some form of suicide prevention entities within these organizations in your community. Let's take church, for instance. Most churches have a health ministry. Some have a health ministry and a mental health ministry. Most of them have health ministries with mental health combined. Number one, you got physical health, that should be one ministry. You got mental health, that should be another ministry. Suicide prevention should be another ministry, separate and apart from mental health. Because most of us, uh, under the common belief that if you're suicidal, it's a mental health condition. Not all the time. You can be suicidal and not be diagnosed with a mental health condition and not be or not have a mental disorder. Suicide and depression are not synonymous. This is why I say separated from mental health. Separated from mental health. The other thing that's important is it's not a numbers game. So let's say you start a suicide prevention discussion 
or ministry and nobody shows up, that's fine. Next month, nobody shows up, that's fine. Next month, nobody shows up. Don't take it off the books. People need to know that it's there. People need to know that every Tuesday at 7.30, once a month, or twice a month, that it's there. And they might take a long time coming. But if you keep it on the books, don't ever take it off the books. If you're going to do it, don't take it off the books. Be committed. It's not a numbers game. If one or two people show up for two months of a meeting, they needed it. They needed it. I've been doing support groups since 2004. If I depended on the numbers, that, that support group wouldn't be running anymore. I still do support because it's inevitable that people are going to kill themselves, leaving behind families lost, not knowing what to do or how to get through it. Because sometimes they become suicidal. So support groups are very important. If you want to start a support group, let me know. We also train people on how to start support groups. So much to say and so little time. So I'm going to stop right there. If you have any questions or you want any resources, you can go to our website, NOPCAS, N -O -P -C -A -S dot org. And when you go on that website, site, the number is there. But I can also give you the number. It's 301-529-4699. Thank you. Up next, we have Charmaine Callender, who's here to talk about elderly care and who cares for the caregiver. This will be a conversation about our family members and their last days, but also as well as what it looks like to be your purpose and also caring, from caring for lives or supporting lives on their journey from beginning to end. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this nurturing segment. All right, community. So as I just introduced, I am here talking with Charmaine Callender, and we're here to discuss elderly care and who cares for the caregiver. So I know a lot of Charmaine's background and history in this area because we are friends, we are sisters, we are besties. And um, but what I would love to have Charmaine do is share a little bit of your background, share a little bit about your role as a caregiver, how you've gotten to that place, and then we'll go on from there. Oh, wow. How did I get to this place of being a caregiver? Margaret. It started off actually as a little girl. I remember the little 12-year-old, um, the little 13-year-old. My family had just transitioned from, uh, migrated from London back to Trinidad. So it was a different kind of lifestyle. There, I got introduced to um, feeding the poor and the hungry. They would do it as a form of thanksgiving, like for your birthday, you would feed, you'll cook and you'll feed the hungry as a way of giving thanks and appreciate appreciation for your um, time around the solar. And so I used to, when it was my time to cook, I would tell this homeless guy across the street, we call him Punk. I say, Punk, make sure you pass tomorrow I'm cooking I'm cooking and my mother used to be hot but it triggered me because she was angry that I was given somebody who couldn't do anything better for themselves I was giving them food and it, it would trigger her and I really didn't put it together until I came up here to the states when I was around 24 I started doing it again on the train they asked for money I'll give them a dollar and she she was like well why do you do that and was like, well, Ma, they're in need. Well, give me the money. I'm in need. I'll show you what I can do with it. Say, you got a roof over your head. You got food on the table. So no, I'm not going to give you the money, but I will give it to them. Um, well, what if they you take it and use it to buy drugs? I said, that's not my concern. My concern is the intention, the energy that I'm giving it to them. So even if they take it and they use it for something, um, not wrong, but use it for something that 
you know, it's not good, like for drugs and alcohol, the energy that I give them that give that money, you give them with that, that comes along with that money. I'm hoping that that energy at that time, I was hoping that energy could transform in them. I had no clue, no clue, Jamie, that this is where I was going to end up with my life. I've always had a knack for the elderly. I love to sit in their lap and listen to their stories and comb their hair and make them feel pretty. Um, Cause you know, we tend to forget them. You know, society tends to forget the elderly now. And so, um, wow. Ooh. I and love then, that. Um, and then I comes love- my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom got ill and um, I looked after her not as often as I can, because she lived in London and I was in the States. So when I would go over there, I would take care of her and whatnot. She became disabled, um, diabetes, breast cancer, stage two, three, um, lupus, you name it, a complicated case. Um, And then after she transitioned, my cousin Margaret got ill and my family member remembered that I used to take care of my mother and so then look after my cousin Margaret and I without even thinking I said yes now she was not the easiest of persons she was not the easiest to deal with but I knew spiritually there was something there for me I did not know at the time what it was but I I knew there was something for me yeah and that's how I end up in in elderly care today and I can even go even further now that we're talking, I just remembered I actually did a CNA course. I never went and got, I never did the state exam to get certified. Got that. Yeah. Isn't that something? So it's something mm-hmm. that has always been there in the making. It's just, I just did not know that's what I was, that's what I was doing. Yeah. I was going to say that's the beauty of life. A lot of times our purpose is sitting there right under our nose but because we're not taught to follow the patterns of our behaviors, of our passions, of the things that fire us up, the things that are causes that we stand up for, we're not taught to follow the the pebbles in the road of purpose. Um, And that's kind of like what comes up for me as you go back through your memory. And I'm sure as we're having this conversation, it'll probably be more instances that pop up in your mind as we're chatting. Um, One of the things that really resonated with me was that that energy. I've always told people um, when I do gift people on the subways and in the trains, um, I I definitely have a a love for the ones that actually just say, listen, I want to get a little drink and I don't have the money for it and whatever, because I give it to them even quicker because of the honesty in it. But again, If they tell me they're hungry and they're going to get food and they do go get drink or drug, maybe that number one, releasing judgment. It's an opportunity for me to release judgment because maybe that is their food. That's right. When you're not in a healthy space and you're not healed and you're traumatized and operating from trauma or from lack, which if you're homeless, how how full are you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So- it's um yeah it's just it's just super interesting how um how p- people's judgments of things they try to place on us and i'm just grateful that people like you and i don't listen to the outside noise that we follow our hearts and where our hearts are guiding us to go because um what i've always said is that at the end of the day if they say it's for one thing and it's for another it's their cross to bear with god yeah. not mine Absolutely. Because like you stated, it, it's from your intention. It's from your heart. It's from you wanting to help that person in that moment of need. So friend, I do know that uh, our Margaret was definitely not easy. So what would you share to those that are out there that may have an elder in their family or maybe the caregiver that's giving to the elderly members in their family, whether it's a parent or a distant family member. Um, I have a cousin in Virginia who's supporting with lovely Aunt Mary right now, um, who's not in her last days, but is just in a space in life where she needs that support. Mm -hmm. What do you find are some of the challenges that you come up against, one that you came up against, number one, and then also share 
some of maybe some tips that you would give to folks as you're walking into this new because I'm sure when you said yes back home in Trinidad number one you were picking up coming back to New York again to live you you were newly married and also didn't really know what you were saying yes to because you hadn't necessarily seen her in this new space. Yes, she was your cousin, but you knew her, but she was also your mom's cousin. So she's an elder, older than you. And you didn't know what you were walking into. You didn't know what you were walking into contract wise with the family. You didn't know what you were walking into living arrangement wise, like so many things that you didn't know. What are some of the 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 gems that you could give to the community who may end up in this same position? Ooh. Make sure you negotiate for yourself first and foremost. Um, even though it's family, we tend to get comfortable. I got comfortable. You know, it's my family, it's my cousin, it's Margaret. Um, I knew her since the age of 24 and she remembered me and, oh, I, and I did not like her. So I looked at it as an opportunity to get to know her again. But she, like I said, she wasn't, she was not, as you know, she was not a nice person. She softened up a lot in the end, but um, yeah, make sure that when you negotiate with family, that you, you, you put time in there for yourself because um in the heat of the moment, when we're all trying to figure things out, um, and it's human nature sometimes, we tend to, we'll, we'll, we'll meet at the, on, on, the, on the meeting block and we come to the solution. And then once we've got the solution, everybody disperse like ants and go back into their perspective places and they forget the person that they put there. So that's why I say it's key. Um, that if you, if it's family, whether it's family or not, negotiate your time for yourself, where you at least get two days out of the week for yourself and that you don't walk in, um, taking yes, 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 yes. The yes is out of the mouth and nothing in, and nothing written in black and white. You need a contract, get a contract that says, I'm going to work from Monday to Friday. I'm off Saturday or I leave Friday night at nine o'clock and I come back Sunday evening at nine o'clock. You got to have it in black and white because when you don't, people forget. They walk out and they forget. You don't forget because it, it pertains to you, but everybody else forgets because it's not really important to them. Yeah. Some other gems is to give yourself grace, to find healing circles where you can actually get that support, I'm not sure I understand. where you can actually get that support. I don't know what's wrong with Siri, but she don't understand <laughs> technology today. Um, yeah. Get, find yourself support, get that support. Um, it's really, really, really key. Uh, I didn't have that support in the beginning and I was like pulling my hair out. As you know, when we first, when we met, I was like, Oh my God, I was so frustrated. Um, until I started putting things in place, I started taking that time, taking back me time and going to the gym, taking me time and doing be the tree, taking me time and doing wake up everybody and be the tree and wake up everybody. Uh, for those who don't know, the healing um, spaces um, that both Jamie and, and myself, we, uh, we participate in. Um, and if it wasn't for those two and for our friendship and being able to have that that outside support, someone just to listen when I when I'm in story and I'm going a mile a minute, <laughs> just for somebody to 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 listen is key. So have make sure you have a support system in place, um, other than making sure that you have negotiated time for yourself and make sure you negotiate your money right as well, because family will do you dirty. Family will do you dirty. And, and the things that family expect you to do, because it's family and they paying you, family expect you to do every and anything. So you're not just caregiver, but you're also the advocate for the, for the person. You're also the um, ears, eyes, nose, everything for this individual. And the family expects for you to report back to them in great detail as to what's going on with their loved ones. Mind you, some of them don't want to get involved, but they want you to be able to tell them everything. So you have to really have that um, supportive network 
Yeah. Have that network support network in place. So you have somewhere where you can go and you can dump your frustrations. You know, what comes up for me as well is uh, boundaries. Yeah. Creating awesome. boundaries because while yes, you, the family member can't do it themselves, but sometimes they, they want an unrealistic account of what has taken place. Like when you're in action and taking care of someone, it's very hard to relay everything. So it's almost like when you're in those predicaments where someone's micromanaging you and you have to create that boundary to, to not control, but to balance, to balance how it lands on you. Because mm -hmm. if we allow people to dictate every little thing of what they want from us, then they could be taking everything. And where's the time for you? Because if you're caregiving all day long, now you got to give account all night long. Where's your you time? Yeah. Yeah. I had no, I had no me time. I had, I no remember, me. I remember. And I remember you having to pay other people in to order to have that you time. In, in order so, to have that you time. Mm-hmm. So community, hear this, hear this, that when she's saying negotiate your prices, that it's more than just your, your time per hour that you're looking for. You're looking for everything that you would look for on a regular job, everything that you want on a regular job. Why, yes, they may not pay medical benefits. They may not pay this, but give me the paperwork to be able to go and get what I need to get then. That's right. Support me just like you want me to support you. Mm -hmm. It, in order for me to care give, I have to be able to care for myself. So make sure that there's a backup family member. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't yeah. have the person be the only family member, especially if you're operating from a space of this is a family person. So let's treat them this way. Then yes, you definitely need to make sure that you're getting more than one family member that signs up for this because I saw what that looked like. I saw what it looked like on you. And even though you started the working out and you started the, your different things and doing different things, I also saw what it put on you to now do two jobs in one yeah. Yeah. at one time. And yeah. while you learn to manage it, which is the, the, the basis of our work is learning how to deal with this crazy life and, and not be triggered left and right and to deal with our stuff so that we can actually deal with the real life stuff. I saw you doing that and saw it in actual action and what it looks like. But I also saw the toll that it was taking on you in the process. And still today, you know, what, and that's why I say it's so important to make sure in the beginning you negotiate that time for yourself because I was a Oh my God, before I left and went to, 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 to Georgia, you know, I got to mention my home, Georgia, y'all. <laughs> Georgia is where my heart is. I live in New York, but Georgia is where my heart is. Um, and my kids and grandkids are actually, they stay, stay, stay in Georgia. But um, mm, what's coming up for me is I did not have any time for myself and I lost who I, I lost the social side um, of who I am. Got that. I was a social butterfly here in New York. Got you that. can tell me nothing this time of the year. I call this Caribbean time. Cause you know, the parties out there, we doing our thing and be from Memorial day to labor day. Yeah. <laughs> and I've become so conditioned to staying in a house 24-7, 365, that now when I get invited to go out places, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, I was just getting ready to say, so there's one other area that I would be remiss to not flow the conversation in that direction. And I'm sure that a, this was probably the height of most of people's experiencing exactly what we're talking about. And this was not even just with the elderly. This was as we all had to like take care of each other when the world shut down. You were also at the beginning or in the spin of this tail journey. So what else comes up for me is like, what does it look like when you're caregiving for an elder you have programs and places that they go to in place so that they can have a social life and still interact 
and then the world shuts down mm. because I have it that we have no idea when that can happen again. It could happen tomorrow and we have no idea. It could come around again. Yeah. We don't know when another air born something is going to happen and we don't know when we'll be back to being Mm-hmm. As, especially as you see technology and all these things put into place. Mm-hmm. And then not only that, we're about to go into 2024 presidential runs. So we have a climate that could easily be shut down at any time. We live in a society that although we, we operate from this, this entitlement of freedom mm-hmm. and entitlement of do what we want, when we want, how we want, we never know when that's going to come to a halt again. So share what that was like. What was it like to have someone that was in programs, had places to go, mm-hmm. who then had nothing, nowhere to go. And you just shared the impact on you. But I know that there was probably even more further impact that was there. Yeah, yeah. So um, share yeah. that with us. Yeah. Um, wow. When the country, when the world shut down and I could not take... Margaret to any I couldn't take her to church she was one love to eat I couldn't take her out for her little tea her cup of tea or restaurant um she liked to um go visit family I couldn't we couldn't go anywhere and um mm, it was so beautiful because even I had even though we were at a standstill I got to be at a standstill as well. And in that standstill, I was able to find empathy deep down. I've always had empathy because I'm from the school of social work, but you know, when it's a family member, you tend to be frustrated more. And I was not exercising. I wasn't operating with her from the, from the um, lens of empathy at all. It was all personal. Um, but empathy, I got a, ref- a newness a refresher look on how to have empathy. And we started enjoying each other. The first day I was able to actually take her to her doctor's appointment. We sat down, um, it was out in Long Island. We sat down outside and we walked across to the diner and we sat down and we just ate. And we could not believe, um, even though she had to mention what, that there were moments when she was coherent, when she could would connect. And I'll say, Margaret, isn't this such a beautiful thing that we can finally come outside and eat? And she said, you know, that's right, Terry. <laughs> you know, because she never called me Charmaine. She always called me Terry. Um, yeah. I got to find myself with the, uh, then wake up, everybody was birthed. I was doing Be the Tree and those two safe spaces is what really helped me develop that emphatic side of me. Yeah. So I was able to deal with her, even though I was on lockdown myself and I was able to deal with my, deal, deal with myself. But b- back then I did not realize that I was being conditioned to not coming back out into the world. I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't know it. Now. I do, I know it today because I can find every excuse under the moon and the sun why I don't <sighs> go out with somebody. Yeah. And you I come back. I also have it that part of it is not even just that. We got so used to like being dressed down, not getting all glammed up and going through. Oh, 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 no, 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 not me. Not going me. through them steps like like who wants to do all them steps I don't want to have to get dressed to go outside I just want to click my me. heels I just want to click my heels and be there that's so it Charmaine going through the whole thing Charmaine that's don't sit in front of the mirror and beat in the face for an hour but, half um, hour and a half. I know I don't mind I don't I didn't mind doing those things I didn't mind and and it was brought to my attention Kim said to me, my daughter Kim, she said, Ma, you know, you used to dress really, really nice. It was a fly dresser. What's going on with you? You used to always be going out. You're always doing something now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I literally have to, and that's one of the impacts of you not having these pause. things in place. Yeah. Now I have to do the work and um, unpack 
that fear factor. Uh -huh. So why am I so comfortable of wanting to be within four walls rather than being out in the world where my energy can be felt, where my purpose, you know, my purpose is healing God's creation from beginning to end. Who can feel that in out there in the universe if I'm behind closed doors? Well, I actually love that you actually just shared and introduced what your purpose is because I actually, you know, as we start to wind down the time in our 30 minutes together, I would love for you to share how you've also discovered that not only are you an elderly caregiver, but you are a caregiver for, for those that are from the beginning to end. And before you dive into that, what I would love to like point out to the world is that, you know, we live in a society that has a really hard time accepting death and handling death because we're not taught to honor that as we begin, we have to end. Okay. And I love the fact that you not only care for the elderly, you also care for babies from the time that they are born, like literally come home from the hospital. And you know, there's this side of my eyes growing up in New Yorker who has seen tons of nannies raising. I know that you're not a nanny. Mm -hmm. you are a caregiver and what you bring to the table is just what you shared I know the relationships that you have with the parents of the babies that you're supporting share with the community what it looks like to actually be a caregiver from beginning to end wow wow so um from the beginning um well, let me say, first say I'm not a caregiver in the beginning. It's, um, I'm a newborn care specialist. And so my role, and my role is mixed. Um, I've done um, birthing, postpartum, um, breastfeeding, doula trainings. Uh, and so it's my, my newborn care specialist is wrapped around that energy. Um, and so I... Um, Mm, you asked me a really good question here, you know, Jay. <laughs> so I, um, I go into the home, but, um, I go in to meet the family's needs. So when I go in, I'll ask, when I'm contracted, I will ask mom and dad, what, is the ideal thing they're looking for. I want my baby to, you know, be on a nice eating schedule and I want my baby to be able to sleep because when I go back out to work, you know, I want baby to be sleeping throughout the night. And so I go in and that's what I do. Um, I sit with mom, we make our plans. If the doctor says baby has to eat every two hours, every three hours, do you prefer to breastfeed? Do you want to pump? Do you want to, you know, I do all of these things with mom and I empower the parents, you know, a lot of parents, which is so strange to me. Um, and because of how I was, how I was raised, I was raised taking care of kids. I'm the eldest granddaughter, the eldest niece. So I find it so strange that now that I come in, I meet families that don't know how to hold a baby. They don't know how to burp baby. They don't, they literally don't know anything about children. And so I'm glad that I have that background where I can come in and I can teach the parents and empower mom, especially with the first two weeks after giving birth with postpartum. Those are the two weeks that you really want to empower mom and keep your eye on her to make sure that she's not going down that, that slippery slope of postpartum and just meeting the family where they are, you know, even though you're behind the scenes orchestrating it, but you're doing it from a place where they think that they are in control and you let them know that they are in control. At the end of the day, it is, it is their baby because when you finish with your four weeks or your six weeks, or if you're there for 12 weeks, when you finish with your assignment and you leave, you're leaving the baby there. So you got, so my role is to make sure that baby is well suited for mom and dad's world not they switch for baby's world but the baby comes into our world and the baby adjusts into our world 
Perfect. I was just saying, I love that. I love that. And seeing where spirit wanted me to go next with the conversation as we start to wind down and wrap up. And you know, Jamie, I get to, I, I'm a, I'm a tie in for you. Uh-huh. My, my, my purpose is healing God's creation from beginning to end. So in the beginning, I get to speak high vibrational energetic words into these little human beings. Because if we take a look at this world and see how this world is crazy, this world is not just crazy with us adults, it's crazy from our children come up. So I get to speak high vibrational energy into this case. I don't know what the impact would be because I don't get to see them after I leave with that assignment. They grow up and they get big. But I'm, I'm hopeful that my um, energy impacts them so much that they come out into this world and they find their their purpose as well and they do do well they do good for humankind when it comes to the end side of life that's a sacred moment that that that's how I look at it look at it as a sacred moment that yes the elm this person is transitioning however I'm getting an opportunity to make sure that this person leaves this realm in peace this person knows that they're loved. This person knows that they're healed. And, mm. and they know that you who taking care of them, you're going to be okay. That's so true. I just I just love both sides. And I get to speak to the person that's transitioning. It's okay. We yeah. love you. Head on up there, girl. You better make some space up there for me. Bake some hot cross buns for me till I get up there. And then in the beginning of life, I'm pouring into that human being so that human being can find who they are and their purpose on in this planet. And I'm complete. Ashe, I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, it speaks to everything that came up for me about you knowing you personally. Um, that just what you shared is why I've never considered you a nanny because nannies are basically like the mothers. In my mind, the nannies that I've seen, the stories that you see when people grow up, they're sometimes even more connected to their nanny than their own moms. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love that you empower. I love that you, even during Margaret's last days, the empowerment that you gave her with choosing how she wanted to be in those moments. Do you want to hear this music? Would you prefer TV? Making sure that she was as comfortable as possible. Do you need to sit up? Do you need to lay back? You know, the the very small things. Absolutely. Um, Being a fellow doula, that is one of the things that I learned for myself and really started. And it actually shifted my experience with death and my outlook on death. I had long been working on transforming it But through my grandmother's transition during COVID, the fact that I I had the honor that it was before things hit the fan and they shut everything down, that I was able to be with her. And I was sharing with someone recently that all the work that we do for ourselves, the self-care that we give ourselves, our understanding of how the healing work so that we're not hurt people, hurting people, the work that we do on ourselves, with ourselves, prepared me to have a strength that I would have not thought my grandmother was my best friend she was my first best friend in this world and although she was tough and rough she was my soft spot so you know with that being said being there with her when she was unintubated and I don't even know if that's the word you use for it but I'm making that up today folks unintubated that was when they took the tube out of her throat but getting to clean the stickers from the side of her mouth, getting to, she had been intubated for over a week, getting to clean all of that, getting the clean. Intubated. As intubated, no, intubated, the two. Incubated. No, incubated is when the babies are in the the thing. Oh, it is, it's intubated. Intubated, it's a tube because they're intubating, they're giving you a tube down your throat. You're right, incubated is in, yeah, you're right. the NICU. Um, so when they take the, the, took the tube out and just getting to like, you know, clean her up. She had been in the hospital over a week, getting to just, you know, when they're in the hospital and that concern with all the crust and the different things, they're just managing the breathing and the actual body. Um, they'll, you know, yeah, of course they mm-hmm. maintain her here and there, but yeah, but it's not, it's not intimate. It was, and I got to be intimate with her, with my mom on one side of her and me on the other side, 
And it was the most valuable moment of my life to this moment outside of giving birth to my son. Um, and it helped me really understand how important that it is for our elders to be cared for in the end of life. So I love that you're out here in the world doing this work. I pray that there's someone out in the community today that was able to receive some nourishment and some gems and some um, what to do's from this conversation, maybe even some healing and some transforming. And, um, and do, do reach out to Charmaine if you, we will, her details will be in the recap for today's session. And um, if you're looking for a beginning of life person or an end of life person, she is there for you. She no longer care gifts for the elderly, but at, as they are transitioning, I'm sure she would be a doula for you if, if that's what's needed. So community, Charmaine, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you, Miss Calendar. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. And what, what a wonderful contribution for Juneteenth. Thank you so much. Okay. And one last question. Tell us what Juneteenth means to you. Wow. Well, mm, for somebody who was not born in America, um, who was British born with uh, Trinidadian background, what Juneteenth means to me is liberation. Liber Ju Ju Juneteenth means freedom. Juneteenth means togetherness. And it also means a celebration of what we once was because we're going to be that again. That's what, yeah, that's how I look at Juneteenth. I don't just look at, um, yes, they burned down our Wall Street, Black Wall Street. Yes, they destroyed, but I don't just focus on that. I love the fact that now we're recognizing Juneteenth because where we were then, we are going to be again. Amen. Amen and our shame. Shame. And thank you for that. With that being said, there's nothing else to say. Nothing else to say other than thank you. Amen. Okay. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining me here. Uh, my name is Alana Brown and I am the owner of Brown Sage Design. We, we started this about three years ago, just before COVID. And it was actually based on a Mother's Day contribution that our church was having. We kind of did a spa day for all the ladies in the surrounding housing projects and we just invited them to church and get a complete makeover and drew me as part of what I contributed to that event. So it was a hit with everyone. They, they liked it, they posted it, and that's actually where Brown Sage Design was actually launched. And it has been going great ever since. We create handmade jewelry for both men and women. And we cater to the men and women who like to just wear something different, basically out of the ordinary. And we figure that we're in our jewelry, be like the ultimate piece that you add to just complete your outfit. So that's what we kind of aspire at Brown Sage Design. We try to use recyclable material, recyclable beads, as well as our packaging also are recyclables. So we just try to keep it, you know, help to keep our planet going for as long as we can for the next generation. So we have a firm belief in that as well. And we will be online actually on Friday, June 16th. We'll be part of that online summit. So feel free to join us. My website is www.brownsagedesigns.com. You can go there, see what you like, and just join us on June. I'm so excited to share all our products with you. Um, this is an exciting time for all our people, and I'm just happy to have this opportunity to be here today. Thank you.